Good morning, Lakeway. Good morning, Lakeway. Are we awake? <laughs> it's good to see you all here this morning. Um, I want to welcome each of you to, to Lakeway, everyone online. Uh, welcome with us as well. Um, a little later in the service, we're going to take up the offering. And at that time, we've got two cards that I want you to be aware of now. We have a prayer request card. If you have any prayer requests during the service, go ahead and fill that out. You can uh, choose whether it's going to be just Pastor Mike or the elders or, or everyone in the church to pray for those. Very important. Um, also, if you're a first-time visitor here, we've got a welcome card we'd like for you to fill out. So we've got a record of your visit. And um, after the service, you can see uh, Bob Chesney in the back. Bob, raise your hand. Bob, hello, Bob, raise your hand. You can see him. We've got a mug and a, and a pen that he can give you after the service if you're visiting. Um, and thank you for being here. Um, at this time, uh, everyone stand up. And um, I was thinking on the way in, I was looking up at the clouds. And um, there's beautiful blue sky and a little bit of clouds. And I was kind of thinking how many of us come into church like that. Um, the Lord's given us a beautiful day and, and a, a beautiful blue heart, but we bring those clouds in with us and it gets in the way. So uh, as we go into service in a minute, I'm going to pray to, to open that up. Just ask you to think about those clouds you brought in this morning um, and anything that's going to get in the way. Just release those up into the sky and let the Lord have them and open your hearts up for, for praise. At this time, turn around and, and say hello to everyone uh, online, and then, then shake each other's hands and welcome each other to Lakeway. We used to do this a lot. <clears throat> Good morning, y'all. <laughs> Good. Okay, let's get started. <laughs> kind of miss that. We haven't done that much in a while. Okay, let's all bow our heads and, uh, and welcome the Lord into, into the house. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for the beautiful blue sky, and uh, we thank you for the clouds too. The, those clouds help us look to you. And uh, this morning, I just ask that you help us to release those clouds that we brought in with us, open our hearts and our minds. Um, that we can praise you like you deserve to be praised, that you are glorified, and that we receive the message that Mike would give us this morning through you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. How are we doing this morning? Has everybody had a good summer? I know it is almost over for me. Almost. Um, well, let's worship the Lord this morning. because pumpkin lattes are on the way. <laughs>
my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. It's hard sometimes, though, to give it to God, isn't it? We feel like we need to take it all on us. We can do it, right? But then anxiety floods in, and oh, yeah, I can't do it on my own. And then we need to rely on God's strength again. And that whole cycle just continues and continues and continues building our strength and our faith. And throughout our entire life, we'll continue to do that, right, where we think we can do it on our own, and then we realize our need for God. It's a beautiful thing. Um, so let's let's continue on singing about that great love.
Amen. You guys had never heard that one before, right? Well, this next song is new. Not new, new. It's, you've probably heard it before on the radio, but we have not um, used it in worship here before. It's called Me on Your Mind. And I've been thinking about this a lot lately, about how God can know every detail of every one of our lives individually so perfectly and all at the same time. Like, how does that work, you know? And I think that that's, it's just one of the big mysteries about God, right? And how big he is. So um, my uh, middle daughter is um, four and Evelyn, and she, um, I was going to homeschool my littlest ones because since the moment she was born, I just didn't want anyone to hold her, not even like my husband. So I just could never imagine sending her to school. Like she was just going to stay with me and that's just how it's going to be. So, and surely I was smart enough to do that, right? Well, no, she's smarter than me already. And so we have decided that we're going to put her in three-day preschool. And it's a lot for me. It's a lot for me. So I've just been meditating on this idea lately, not an idea, the truth, that she's her own person. God had her plan on his mind from the beginning, and that no matter where she goes, even if I'm not with her holding her hand, he is. Intimately, deeply, knows her. He formed her in the depths of the earth. Like, the, these are the things, right, that we, we know that God has just perfectly ordained. And so that gives me so much comfort and peace that on her journey, she is, she has her own, her own deal with God, right, that I'm not even a part of. And we all have that. And so I just love that. And so anyway, if that gives you any comfort going back into the school year, if you're like me and you're nervous to send your babies off, just know that, you know, God is with them and he, he has that personal loving relationship with them and he's going to be with them every day. So... I've read the words in red How you leave the 99 To find the one missing Feels like it was written With me on your mind The prodigal son who ran Leaving his home Heavenly home on high 
You're preparing a place where the sorrows erase, and I stand before you. I'll find. God, thank you so much for knowing us so personally, God, and knowing our struggles, our fears, our anxieties, our joys, what brings us peace, what brings us hope. And so, God, I just thank you for who you are this morning. I pray for Pastor Mike as he brings the message this morning that you have breathed into his heart, and we are just so eager to hear that. I pray that we would Receive it with open hearts, open minds, God, and hear what you have to tell us this morning. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you, worship team. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all. It's good to be back. <clears throat> Isn't that funny? You know, <laughs> you do that, you get a croaky voice, and everybody goes... <clears throat> Oh, I don't know if you saw the service last week um, <laughs> with a nice bright blue background and I look like a tomato. <laughs> tomato. tomato. <laughs> Thank you. Well, today is the last day of Bible peeps. And uh, for the message this morning, I want to finish off what I began last week talking about Martha and Mary. Now, if you haven't been here or you don't know what I'm talking about, we've, we've been looking at, um, we've been doing this Bible Peep series for quite a number of weeks, looking at different individuals in the Bible, exploring their lives a little bit and seeing what we can learn from them that we can apply to our lives. And Martha and Mary are, are just a great, great study. You can go to our website and go to our Facebook page, get any of those messages. You can look at me uh, looking like a tomato last week. Mary and Martha come up three times in the Scriptures, three different occasions. One is in Luke chapter 10 that we looked at last week. Last week. Uh, one is in John chapter 11, and one is in John chapter 12. And we're going to look at those today. Now, there's a lot of Scripture here, so I'm going to go a little bit quick this morning. So let me give you a quick review of the one in Luke 10, because it sets up where we're going today. That's the one where Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He passed through Bethany, the village where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus live. Martha invites him into the house for dinner, him and his whole entourage. Now, there's no mention of Lazarus in this particular account. And then during the account, most people know this one, Martha's busy preparing dinner in the kitchen. Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet, and Martha gets little burned at that and comes out as a little hissy fit. And Jesus responds in Luke chapter 10. He says, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. And the question that we explored last week is what's that one thing? What is that one thing? I mean, ultimately, if you want to make it really simple, knowing Jesus is the one thing that matters, right? We all kind of know that, but it's, it's at a certain level. It's at an intimacy. And if you allow anything other than Jesus to become your one thing, that could be position, power, pleasures, possessions. I mean, we all know the trappings of life. and know all, all the subcategories, fear, resentment, jealousy, hurt. If you let any of those things become your one thing, it changes the focus and the direction of your life. Your life will not be as good as your life could be 
if Jesus was your one thing, because you're chasing after things to, to get you what Jesus already has for you if you would just give him the opportunity. This morning, we're going to look at these two passages in, in John chapter 11 and 12. Now, I didn't have a chance to put notes together, but if you like to take notes, today's a good day for notes. There's a blank note sheet. If anybody needs one, Bob's already up on his feet. Anyone want a note sheet? We'll see how... Yeah, uh, come on, please, somebody just raise your hands. Thank you, Hector. Thank you, over. Well, well, I know we put them in the bulletins too, so most of you have them. And online, I'm sorry, you're just going to have to take notes for yourself. But this is a good one for notes. So we're going to look at this second encounter that Jesus has with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. It's found in John chapter 11. Most people are familiar with it, and it's the whole chapter. So I'm going to read quick. We're not going to get into everything, but we're going to get into the important stuff. It says, a man, I'm reading from the New Living. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters Mary and Martha. So let me set the scene here again. Jesus has recently been in Jerusalem for one of the big festivals, Hanukkah. He gets into a big deal in the temple, gets into a fight with the religious leaders. He's stirring things up. He, he knows where this is going, and, uh, and they all want to stone him. So he gets out of Jerusalem, but he doesn't go all the way back up to Galilee. He crosses the Jordan River to where he originally started his ministry. You can kind of see, see there's a Bethany on the right there, and there's another Bethany because they were short of names. The one on the right is Bethany beyond Jordan. So that's where Jesus is hiding out. And he's going to head over to the other Bethany, which is just outside of Jerusalem. Just to give you an idea, it's about 17 miles. Remember, they're walking, okay? So that kind of sets it up. And to me, it's kind of like full circle because this is right before Jesus goes into Jerusalem in the, in the last weeks of his life. And it's, it's like He's gone back to the place where his ministry began. This is where John the Baptist baptized him. Now he's back there again, and he's about to complete his earthly ministry. It says, this is Mary, who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick, so the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. Now, I said this last week, we don't know the history of this relationship, but it's a deep one. Jesus, th this family is special to Jesus. These aren't just anybody. These are, he stays at their house. Can you imagine that? If Jesus is on the way somewhere and he's passing through your town, he stays at your house. He stays at their house on numerous occasions. In fact, I'm not going to get into it today. I was hoping to. I won't have time. In that last week of his life, it's most likely that he stayed every night in this house, because he kept leaving Jerusalem, going out to Bethany. He probably stayed with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and, and might have been someone else in there too. So it's no ordinary relationship. It says, but when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God, so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. Now, this is a very difficult concept. And it comes up multiple times in Scripture. This is our first lesson for this morning. So if you're taking notes, the primary purpose of our lives is to bring glory to God so that those who don't know God may come to know God. Let me say that again. The primary purpose of our lives is to bring glory to God so that those who don't know God may come to know God. If you want to know what you're here for, that's what you're here for, is that through your life, people might come to know God. Now, you might think you're here for some other reason, but let me assure you, this is the reason that you're here. If this world and our existence here was the end of the story, if this is all that there is, then we would have every right to live for today, wouldn't we? Because this is the only moment I've got. If, if this is all I got, it's go for it, right? YOLO. You know what YOLO means? You only live once. Half the people here know. <laughs> you only live once, right? Whoa, party hardy. Grab all that you can and let's go for it. I mean, there's, live like there's no tomorrow. Why not? Because there's no tomorrow. 
If this, if this moment is our only moment, we'd better make it count. And a lot of people live that way. And, and, if, and if that were the case, you'd have every right to ask God for a comfortable, blessed life. Gimme, gimme, gimme. I want, I want, I want. But for followers of Christ, we don't believe YOLO. We have a different acronym. I, I heard this from a pastor, and I liked it, and I stole it from him. You've gone one ahead of me, sir. It's too late now. Or did I leave one out? Keep going then. Yelf. Yelf. You always live forever. You always live forever. I, I like that. If you believe, as I do, that the best is yet to come, that's going to change your outlook on life. That's going to change your perspective on life. That's going to change the reason that you get up in the morning. When you believe that the yet, best is yet to come, you're not just living for today. Because today really isn't that important. The best is yet to come. I mean, if, if this is all there is, then you have every right to get mad at the Lord when things don't go the way you think that they ought. You have absolutely every right if this is all there is. You would be justified. But if you truly believe in eternity with Christ, then the primary focus of your life should be helping as many people as possible get that eternity. That's what we're here for. We are here to live joy-filled lives that point people to Jesus. Do you know what fuels joy? Gratitude. Gratitude fuels joy. If you're not a thankful person, you're not going to have any joy in your life. But if you're thankful, your life is going to be filled with joy. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. You cannot be thankful in all circumstances if YOLO. Because if this is all there is and you're in a miserable time, who's going to be thankful for that? Now, Yolf, you always live forever. That doesn't mean that we're impervious to the pains and the hurts of life. Just because you know that the best is yet to come doesn't make you immune to the emotions and the pains and the hurts of today. We live in a broken world. And we're going to see that as we go through this passage. But knowing that, this is, that, that, that there's something more than this has to change your outlook and your disposition. Even if it's rotten right now, this is not all there is. I know it gets better. So back to our passage here. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. Now, if you didn't understand Yalf, if I say Yalf, you know what I'm talking about now, right? And you didn't understand Jesus' desire to bring glory to the Father to build the faith of his disciples, to build the faith of Martha and Mary and all those around him. If you didn't know that, then that last sentence would make no sense to you. Why would it say, he loved them, therefore he decided to hang around for another couple of days? This is a faith-building exercise. That's what's going on here. Now, I'm going to read right through the next section because I want to get to the Martha and Mary bit. So keep up. <laughs> says, but his disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going there again? Jesus replied, there are 12 hours of daylight every day. During the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of this world. But at night, there is a danger of stumbling because they have no light. Then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he's sleeping... He will get soon, he'll soon get better, right? This is my wife's theory. If you're sick, go to bed. Sleep it off. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, guys. So Jesus already knows. Lazarus is dead. 
And for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. What a weird thing to say, eh? For now, you will really believe. This is a faith-building exercise. Come, let's go. Let's go see him. Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go to and die with Jesus. Oh, another sermon. <laughs> Lesson number two. Jesus uses difficult circumstances to build our faith. Sometimes when we're in the middle of difficulties, we want to pray that God will get us out of those difficulties. We just want to get through this. And what this scripture teaches us is that sometimes Jesus allows difficulties into our lives. He might not be the source of those difficulties, but he allows those difficulties because he's going to use those difficulties to build our faith to strengthen our faith, to strengthen our perseverance. He also uses them to equip us to minister to other people. So when you're in the middle of difficulties, it's okay to pray and say, God, you know, please help me. But don't forget to ask God, what is it you want me to learn from this? What do you have for me in this, Lord? What am I going to take from this? God will never waste your pain if you give him your pain but it's still your pain, and that's what's hard about this. Jesus didn't cause Lazarus to die, but he's going to use Lazarus' death to build the faith of those around him. He has a purpose for our pain. Verse 17, it says, when Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Now, this is important. This is a little side note here. There was a Jewish tradition, after three days, they would go into a tomb to check and see if the person really was dead. Now, if I was sick, and I'm lying in a tomb for three days before somebody comes to check on me, I'd be a little disappointed. But it's important in this passage of Scripture, because if they had not gone in there after three days to check that Lazarus was dead, when Jesus called Lazarus up out, somebody could have said, wasn't dead. He was just sleeping. A little side note for you there. He was already dead for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Mary and Martha in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary stayed in the house. Now, this is a whole flip-flop here. In Luke, Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus while Martha's in the kitchen working, right? And now we've got this situation where there's a really serious situation. Martha gets up from where she is. She goes out of town. She meets Jesus on the way. Mary stays at home. This is a flip-flop. Something changed in Martha's life. I think that after the little rebuke, you know, as I shared last week, I think Martha went and sat at the feet of Jesus just like Mary, and something changed in Martha's life. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. So this is something that we do sometimes. She wants to believe and she wants to have faith, but she's struggling with the reality of the situation. Her brother's dead. He's been dead for four years, days. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All that's left are a few bones. <laughs> four days. She's looking at the reality of the situation and she's thinking, oh, maybe Jesus could have done something a day ago, two days ago. But we're past that already. So when Jesus makes this statement, your, your, your brother's going to come alive, Martha does what we often do. We have a big picture faith, but sometimes we don't have an everyday faith. We trust Jesus with the big picture of forgiveness of sins. I put my life in his hands. That When I pass on from this life, I have another life. Yes, I trust him with that. Check that box. But when it comes to the immediacy of faith and the everyday things, sometimes we falter. We trust Him with our salvation, but not our finances. We trust Him with our lives, 
but not our talents and our goods. We trust Him for eternity, but not with our time. We trust Him with the, with the big thing, but not for our marriage or our children. Where are you, Kayla? Or our health. Oh, yeah, God's got me taken care of. I'm not sure about this other stuff. And we falter because we live in the immediacy of this, right? It's right there. It's in our faces. Eternity is some hazy place down the road. And even though we want to get there, we don't want to get there today, do we? <laughs> so Martha defaults to the big picture of faith. You, oh, oh, you mean on the last day, Jesus. Now it gets heavy. Now it gets heavy. This is a fantastic passage of Scripture. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. That's a biggie. Now, when Jesus says, I am the resurrection, he's telling her, death has no power over me. It can't hold me down. It can't hold me back. And when he says that I am the life, he's telling her that life itself is in his hands. This is an amazing statement. This is a massive passage of Scripture. This is the whole gospel. He continues on. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me, there's an and, everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? He puts her right on the spot. You're face to face with Jesus. He declares who I am, looks her in the eye and says, do you believe this, Martha? What's she going to say? Yes. <laughs> Third lesson that we learn from Mary and Martha. We need a living faith. We need a faith for eternity and we need a faith for today. We need a faith for right now. We need a faith for the everyday things. You need both levels of faith. That's what it means to live in Jesus. He put an and there, right? You've got to live in me and believe in me. There's this big, big faith, and then there's this faith. Will you trust me with these things? He says, I'm trustworthy. Yes, Lord, she told him, I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Now, in your bulletins, I think I put that, is that verse on there? Circle the words, Lord, Messiah, and Son of God. What an incredible interaction. Martha's confession of Christ as Lord, Messiah, and Son of God is almost identical to Peter's confession of, of faith. When Jesus said to him, who do you say that I am? In Matthew chapter 16. Not bad for the lady who was too busy to stop and listen to Jesus. What a transformation. But it's going to get better. Then she returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here. Another title. The teacher is here and wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him. Jesus had stayed outside the village at the place where Martha met him. When the people who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus' grave to weep, so they followed her. Now, isn't it interesting that Jesus is coming into the town? He meets Mary, sorry, Martha, outside of the town. He has this incredible interaction with Martha. At some point, he tells her, go get Mary, and then he hangs out. He doesn't carry on walking into town. He stays where he is. She goes to Mary and tells Mary, the teacher's here. He wants to talk to you. Lesson number four. You know, we talk about Jesus meeting us where we're at, but sometimes in humility, we have to meet Jesus where he is at. We got to stop what we're doing and physically move to a place to meet Jesus. 
Now, this is important. We live in a fast-paced world, don't we? We're always on the go. We're driving. We're doing something. How many of our prayers are on-the-go prayers? 90? 95%? 100%? They're on-the-go prayers, right? Hey, God, while I'm driving into town here, could you just do this? Could you just do that? What about this? Oh, and I need a sandwich. Could you get a sandwich for me? Sometimes you've got to stop. Sometimes you've got to stop. Sometimes you need to stop what you're doing. You need to put down what you're doing, and you need to go and meet Jesus. I know when I've had difficult circumstances, and I know when some of you have had difficult circumstances, I'll get a knock on the door at the church here. Can I come in? Can I go up to the sanctuary to pray? You can pray anywhere you want, right? But someone has found a reason to stop Whatever they're doing, wherever they are, I need to go up to the sanctuary and pray. I want to meet Jesus at this place. This is why we have First Monday prayer. It's important sometimes to meet Jesus, to go where He is. He's everywhere, but there's this mentality of setting something aside, setting a place aside and saying, I'm going to go meet Jesus right there. This is a quiet place. He has put this building here for a purpose. Not just for us to come in on Sunday morning. This is a place that we can come and meet with Him. Sometimes when I'm in my office, I can pray anywhere, but I'll come down here on a Monday morning or a Tuesday morning, and I'll kneel right here, and I'll pray. I'll call on the Lord. There's no magic here. It's just a mentality. I'm going to go and meet Jesus. And here's where I'm going. Stopped out there for a reason. Go get Mary. Tell her to come to me. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. The exact same words that Martha said to him in the same place. When Jesus, now he doesn't have this dialogue with Mary though. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked them. I can imagine his voice. Now, this is kind of weird, right? We want to change this sometimes. I'll look for a different version. I don't like the anger. The anger is real. Where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him? But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? I could spend the rest of the day on this little passage of Scripture. The humanity of Jesus comes to the forefront right here. I'll tell you a story, share a story with you. As a pastor, I get to see firsthand, more than most, the pain, and the brokenness of this world. I get to be with people often as their loved ones pass away or shortly thereafter. And I get to witness their pain and I get to witness their hurt. I want to share an experience I had not long ago. I'm a volunteer chaplain at Carrollton Regional Medical Center, which used to be Trinity Hospital. And typically when I go there, we have a week each. There's four, four or five pastors that we share a week or on duty for a week. And typically if I go there, it's because the family doesn't have a church or a pastor. Because if they had a church or a pastor, they'd call their pastor. But they don't have one. But there's some sort of faith. Something's going on. So they go to the nurse and they ask, is there a chaplain? And they don't have chaplains there anymore, but we've got this little volunteer team from Denton Baptist Association. And these are the most difficult situations, and it's very, very difficult. So I was at one a couple of months ago. A young husband had passed away unexpectedly suddenly. He had gone into the hospital for a routine surgery, And something happened, I don't remember now what happened, and things did not go well. The family weren't expecting it, 
It was a back surgery or something simple. And they've been at his bedside for a day or so. And they've already been told he, he's not coming back from this. But sometimes it's difficult for the family. You know, you just hold on, you hold on, you're hoping for a miracle. You're praying for a miracle. God, please do something. And, and you don't want to tell the doctors and the nurses, you know, unplug him. So the family's been gathered there at the bedside for a day or so, hoping for a miracle that doesn't happen. And when I get there, they are tired and they are emotionally drained. And it's a huge family. I kid you not, I get there, it's like 20, 30 people packed in the room, out the room, down the hall. His children are in the room. His wife is in the room. His parents are in the room. His brothers and sisters are in the room. His in-laws are in the room. The room is packed. And the pain and the emotion in that room was indescribable. His wife was leaning over him, wailing out loud. Pourquoi, pourquoi, pourquoi? Just wailing and wailing, holding on to him. And holding on to her was her sister who I think was the one that had called for me to come. Her brother was on the other side of the bed, angry, yelling, just angry. And everything's in Spanish, so I don't even know what they're saying. And they're a Catholic family, but if you're not attending a Catholic church, the priest will not come and do last rites for you. We can't even get them to be part of our volunteer group, which is such a sad statement. So they call me to come and pray over the deceased and do some kind of a blessing. Some of them wanted me to pray over him, and some of them wanted me out of there. There was anger at God, and I was there as a representative of God. His wife didn't want me there. She didn't want me to pray for her. She didn't want me to pray for him. I don't know what she said, but it wasn't, please pray. <laughs> her pain and her grief were too much for her. His kids are sitting there. To say that it was a difficult circumstance is an understatement of the greatest degree. I couldn't even talk to his wife. The sisters spoke English. Maybe his wife spoke English. I never discovered. But now i got to pray over this poor fa fellow. And, you know, and they want me to anoint him with oil and do something. Pray a blessing over him that the Lord would accept him. And meanwhile, his wife is draped over him here. His brother's on the other side and yelling. His children are over there crying. His parents are like this, staring at me with a stony face. And I can't communicate with any of them except for one. And when I left there, I was angry. And I mean truly angry. I wasn't just upset. I was angry. I was angry at the situation. I was angry at their lack of faith because that's what put me in the situation. I was angry at the Catholic Church because they weren't there. I was angry at the fact that they were angry at me, and I hadn't done anything. I just come here to help. I was angry at the frustration of not even being able to communicate with them. I was angry at the fact I couldn't help them. And I was angry at the sadness of this young husband passing away in this manner. And as I left and I drove away, I was still angry. And my reaction was, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm getting off this team. But that's not the right reaction. And as I was reading this passage of Scripture, I got thinking about the Lord and how hang angry He must get at this mess that we are in. You see, God is not the cause of the brokenness of this world. We are. 
We're the cause of it. All of the, the death, the dying, the disease, they're all a consequence of sin. And every single one of us is a sinner, right? And it pains God that we chose this path. It angers Him. It brings Him to tears. Our pain pains Him, even though our pain is the, the results, the consequences of our own downfall. It's like a parent, you know, it's like a parent that feels the pain of their children when they take a course, they go down a road that you've warned them about. Don't go down this road. It doesn't go anywhere you want to go. They, maybe they get into drugs or something. You get the young girl, she gets into drugs, and she gets deeper and deeper and deeper into the drugs. And the next thing, she's on the street selling her body to pay for her drugs. And then one day she goes home and daddy sees her and his heart is broken for his daughter. I told you not to go down that path. And he's angry. But he feels her pain. She didn't understand just how dark that road was. I think that's how it is for God. I think his heart is broken. And then we blame him. I see people, you know, things happen in life. Somebody dies and then somebody else dies and somebody else. And there's tragedy upon tragedy upon tragedy in their life. And they start to point the finger at God. <laughs> Meanwhile, God's up there and his heart is breaking for them. I told you not to go down there. Lesson number five, Jesus knows and shares your pain. These are people that he loves. He stayed at Martha and Mary's house. They're not casual acquaintances. Lazarus was not a casual acquaintance. And even though Jesus knows the big picture, he knows that Lazarus is about to come to life. He also knows that Lazarus is going to come to life on the last day too. But he's still angry at the fact that they are in this situation and he is moved emotionally over their pain and he begins to, to cry himself. It hurts him. Meanwhile, you've got people criticizing him. Hmm. Made the blind man see. Maybe he didn't really care about Lazarus. Because that's, that's what comes across. Maybe he didn't really care about Lazarus. Why didn't he do something? I came out in a hurry. I don't have a watch on or a belt. <laughs> so I can't see the time and my glasses can't read that one. Anyway, <laughs> I'll go through this quick. Verse 38. There's no Cowboys game today, is there? Good. <laughs> Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, but Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he's been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Now just think about that for a second. We'd rather not have the odor, so leave him. <laughs> Jesus responded, Didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? I told you this already, Martha. So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said this out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. Can you imagine? That'd be pretty freaky, wouldn't it? He's got cloths wrapped around him. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave, grave cloths, his face wrapped in a head cloth. And Jesus told him, unwrap him, let him go. Many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen. Mission accomplished. All right. I'm going to do the one in 12. I know it's already midday. I'm going to do it real quick, okay? Give me 10 more minutes. 
Fair enough? You know that's 10 pastor minutes. <laughs> Thank you. John 12, we're just going to do seven verses. Six days before, so this is a completely separate event now, okay? Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served. She's back in the kitchen. And Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it. Now, this is not the first time. There are two occasions that this happens. She anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, that perfume was worth a year's wages, should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor, he was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, leave her alone. Back off, Judas. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Now, I'm not going to get into all the symbolism here. There's a lot of it. Mary poured perfume on Jesus that was equivalent to a year's wages. Now, just think about that. Just think about that. When was the last time that you gave a year's wages to Jesus just like that? Let me ask a better question. When was the first time? When you put it in those terms, it changes it a little bit, doesn't it? I've never done it. I've never written a check for a year's wages. Here you go. That's a lot of money simply poured away. That's extravagant. And honestly, Judas is correct. It's a waste. She covered Jesus with perfume. The house stinks. He stinks. It's a year's money. We really could have used that for something better. Uh, Judas is correct. Now, we know his motive's not correct. If my wife poured out anything valued at a year's worth of wages on me, I don't care what it is, I'm not happy. <laughs> Even if she did it out of love, I love you so much. <laughs> what were you thinking? <laughs> It'd be like, are you crazy? But Mary does this. Now, why does she do it? The only answer I can come up with is that she must have been prompted by the Holy Spirit. Jesus knows that he's going to Jerusalem. Jesus knows he's on, knows he's on his way to, to, to die. The Hebrew word for Messiah and the Greek word Christ both mean the anointed. Last lesson of the day. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will prompt you to do something that makes no sense. Do it. Obey the prompt of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't have to make sense. Other people don't have to make sense of it. Now, I hate almost to say this as a caveat. Make sure it's the Holy Spirit and not you. Oh, God told me to go right through the red light, and he was going to be there for me. No, he didn't. <laughs> All right, let me bring this to an end. Six lessons from Martha and Mary. I've seen you taking pictures, and I knew I had them all at the end here. Number one, we live to bring glory to God so that those who do not know God may to come to know God. That is the purpose of our lives. Number two, Jesus uses difficult circumstances to build our faith. Thank Him in those circumstances that He is using it to build your faith. Number three, we need a living faith. It's good to trust Jesus for eternity. Are you trusting Him for today? Are you trusting Him this minute? Are you trusting Him with your kids, with your spouse, with your family, with your health, with your money, with your time, with your talents? Are you trusting Him with everything? You need a living faith. Number four, sometimes we must meet Jesus where He is at. Number five, Jesus knows and shares your pain. Number six, 
Obey the prompt of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Well, that brings Bible peeps to an end. Next week, I will not be here. Randy won't be here. John, where are you? Becky. Oh, John's probably over with you. Becky won't be here. Yeah, you stand in for John. Come on up here, girl. We just had a whole thing about obeying the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you don't have to say anything. You don't have to say anything. I'll get down there. I'll get down there. Um, I'll use the steps. My son-in-law, Chris, is going to bring the message next week. And I know you all like him. So bring people because he'll probably do some magic tricks or something for you. <laughs> he's, he's good at that stuff. We're going to have the elders come up, please. Actually, we're going to have anybody come up that would like to pray. And we're going to ask you to pray over us and pray for the 36 brothers in white that we're going to be ministering to next week. Now, this is like VBS. I know it sounds weird. To, it's frontline ministry. It's frontline ministry. This is where the battle is. This is where the war is. And Satan is already at work. I mean, Becky's on the team. No, sorry. <laughs> oh that was God. just mean, wasn't it? <laughs> no, that was awesome. <laughs> so we need your prayers. I'm going to ask you to pray every day this week through Sunday. It ends next Sunday evening. Some of you are coming up for the closing ceremony. And if you signed up for it, I'm going to encourage you to come up for it. So uh, I'm going to ask you all to pray for us. Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, Lord, we just thank you for those men in 36. But Lord, we pray for the workers. We just ask that uh, you take away any obstacles that may come in their way. And Lord, you keep them focused on the main thing, and that's you. Allow the Holy Spirit to work in a mighty way and allow them to listen to the Holy Spirit and allow them to be receptive to work in a magical way that's going to transform lives, not only in those prisoners, but also with their families and all those that experience this entire event. Lord, protect Mike, protect Randy and each one of these leaders as they serve and honor you and, and uh, represent you. Allow their words to be your words, Holy, Holy Spirit filled, and Lord, uh, may they be impactful. Thank you, Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work that, that these people are going to do for you. That's right. Um, Father, we, we bind the power of Satan that would get in the way this week, that would challenge them, that, to put doubt in their minds, to, to get in the way of the work that you have. And uh, we just ask that everything that happens this week and through Sunday is for you, that it's your work. We know that these workers have already been preparing and that you've already been preparing them for this. Indeed, you've also been preparing those brothers that are going to be there. And we just ask, ask that you would continue that, Father. That, that the work in their lives would be accomplished exactly as you plan it. And uh, we thank you this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 David. Chuck, I thought you had anything going. <laughs> so, wow, what a powerful message today that the Lord brought through Mike. Um, thank him for, for bringing that and Mike for for uh, accepting the call of the Holy Spirit and delivering it. Um, I think that's a message we often need. I was thinking to myself, um, the one thing that that's in my life, you know, it's it's got to be Jesus and, and the Lord. And how often we get busy with the chores of the day or of the week, you know, our work, or even when we're working for the Lord and we lose track of, the purpose that we're doing that for and that's exactly what what the message was today that we remember those messages I don't, I don't know how many times I've been just going through getting a job done um, maybe it's for the Lord um, but it's not working out quite right and it's when I remember the purpose that it's for him and it's his glory that all of a sudden it starts to work and uh, I think that's what the message today was about and I uh, thank the Lord for that um, announcements. Um, September 11th, 
we will change the time of service. So beginning September 11th, our service will begin at 10.30 a.m. instead of 11. Um, so just keep, we'll be home for football. We won't have to worry about um, our purpose. We'll, we'll make it there even as a second purpose. Um, we don't need to announce Hutchins. We just did that. So um, again, let's keep them in prayer all week. Uh, it's a great thing the, the Lord's doing. Uh, Women of Joy, Extravagant Grace, uh, 22 Fall Tour. Um, I'm going to admit I don't know much about that. Um, I'm assuming all of our ladies already do. If you have any questions on that, you can see Becky went or Kelly. Uh, Y'all raise your hand. It's Kelly and Becky. There you are, Becky, back there. Um, that's going to be September 16th through the 18th in San Antonio. It's not too late to sign up. If, if you'd like more information or like to sign up, see Becky or Kelly um, on that. Um, any other announcements I'm missing? Okay. Um, let's bow our heads. To the, hold on. Oh, come forward. if That's kind of an important one. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> come forward if you're going to be taking up the uh, offering. I should have already started that. Rookies, I'll tell you. <laughs> let's ask the lord to bless our uh, our offering today dear heavenly father uh we thank you that it's you that is our first purpose and and it's everything that that we offer to you including our our sacrifice with our monies that goes towards our main purpose which is those who do not know you um, have a chance to know you, and that's what we're here for. We ask your blessing upon this offering, um, whether it be online or right here in, as, as we pass the, the uh, offering envelopes around. And uh, we thank you for it, and it's in your glory that we give. In Jesus' name, amen. So now I don't have anything to say while we're doing this since I jumped before. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, yeah, so uh, online, um, you, can, you can go online um, and, and give your tithes there, of course, this way, or you can drop it in the envelope over there. And if any of you didn't have time to fill out your cards, um, you can still do that afterwards, and you can drop it in that little bucket that's right over by the door, and we can still get them that way. Okay, let's uh, all bow our heads and uh, we'll say a blessing on you for the week. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being here with us today. That you removed some of those clouds, Father, that, that got in the way to, to hear your message or to lift up praises to you. And we just ask that you would continue to do that as we go out about our day. That we'll be uh, consciously thinking about what our number one is and that we're looking to you in all things that we do that it's your purpose and that you're glorified in all that we do and we thank you in jesus name amen <laughs>